Anyway, sorry about that. No, not a issue. Everyone is waiting. It's very. Uh, should I do the prayer, Rabbi? Uh, one second. Let me see what happened. Just. Okay. Yeah, we are all set. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, may it be your will, God, my God, and the God of my ancestors, that you guide my eyes with the light of your Torah and save me from stumbling and making mistakes. For God gives wisdom, and from God's mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Amen. Amen. Parashat Vayetse. So we are next week's parasha. Parashat Vayetse. We will. Again, try to look at some Midrashim and uh, let's before that, let's look at the summary quickly. Would somebody like to volunteer to read it? Can I, Rabbi? Rahel? Please go ahead. Yes, Rachel. Uh, first, Alia, Yaakov is fleeing to Haran. On his way, he stops for the night. He falls asleep and has a dream in which he sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder. God appears to Yaakov and repeats the blessing given to Abraham and Isaac. God promises to protect Yaakov, Yaakov <clears throat> and return him home in Canaan. Yaakov promises that he will worship God. Second Aliyah, he arrives in Haran and meets his cousin Rachel at the community well and is welcomed by his uncle Laban. Jacob falls in love with her and asks her hand in marriage, saying that he'll work for Laban for seven years as bridal price and then marry her. Laban agrees. Third Alia, however, after seven years of labor, Laban tricks Jacob and on the wedding night, Leah his older daughter is substituted for Rachel. After the ceremony, Yaakov discovers the trick and becomes angry. Laban then offers Rachel to Yaakov if he worked for another seven years. Yaakov agrees. Leah gives birth to Yehuven, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda. Rachel remains childless and gives Bilha, her handmaid to Yaakov, gives birth to Dan and Naftali. Leah gives her maid Zilpa to Yaakov and she gives birth to Gad and Asher. Both Alia. Leah further gives birth to Issachar and Zebulun and the daughter Dina. Rachel finally gives birth to Yosef. Yaakov approaches Laban and asks him to allow him to return to his home in Canaan. But Laban negotiates a salary for continued service. Yaakov chooses as his wage the newborn animals distinguished by the different colors that are part of Laban's herd of goats and sheep. With Alia, in spite of Laban trying to trick him, Yaakov is blessed with a fortune in ship, sheep and cattle. After a further six years of working for Laban, he recognizes that Laban and his household were jealous of him. And on receiving a prophecy from God, he decides with Rachel and Leah to flee from Laban. Six Alia, while Laban is out of his house, his entire household flees. Rachel steals her father's idols and Laban follows them, but is warned by God that he can't take revenge for the theft. He questions Yaakov who, while confronting Laban for his years of duplicity, promises him that whoever stole his the idol could not stay alive. The idols were not found and Yaakov and Laban make a peace pact. Seventh Alia, Yaakov and Laban separate and Yaakov arrives at the border of Canaan and encounters angels. Thank you very much, Rahil. So if you all will remember some of our uh, ideas that we discussed last year, we discussed the 
uh, ladder of Jacob. We discussed the connection with the encountering of angels at the end. I strongly suggest all those who are new or all those who have <laughs> forgotten some of the ideas, please go back to the video. It is uh, posted by Jeremiah. Parashat Vayeshev, Vayetse, Parashat Vayetse. And uh, during the during the week, take a look at it also. So I believe it uh, it was one of one of uh, very uh, insightful classes that uh, we had we had studied together. Okay, so today I'm going to introduce a few midrashim and just try to open your. Uh, you know, yourself to the ideas how the rabbis are connecting the dots and what the Midrash wants to do. So this Midrash is Rabbi Shimo Samuel Bar Nachman opened his homiletic exposition with the following words. And the words is, everybody knows the words, Shir Lamalu the Sinai El Harim, Sinai El Harim. So, you know, the word horim means parents and or uh, harim means mountains. So he ma makes a connection with Shir Hamalot and Sinai El Harim. And from there, he takes a uh, jump into our parasha. So let's see what he has to do, he ha how he does it. Rabbi Shmuel ben Na Bar Nachman opened his homiletic exposition with the following verses. A song for ascents. I lift my eyes to the mountain. This is Shirla Malot, Esai Harim. Read the words. I lift my eyes to my Horim. Instead of Harim, Horim. I lift my words, my eyes to my parents who taught me and guided me. From where will my help come? Jacob said at the time that Eliezer came to bring Rivka as a wife for my father, what is said of him? Then the servants took ten of his master's camels, and I don't even have a single earring or bracelet. Rabbi Hanigabe said, God sent him with an entire troop of angels. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said, God sent him with, sent them with him, but when he stood before a Esav, God took them away. Jacob retorted, Am I one to lose my trust in my creator? God forbid that I should lose my trust in my creator. Rather, my help comes from the Lord. That is again the same psalm, second verse. So, Shirva Malot is Sainail Harim, Mayain Yabo Isri. So, he fills in the banks, Shirva Malot is Sainail Harim. And from the Horim, he takes a detour into what is happening in Yaakov's life. And then comes back that my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. Right? He will not let your foot give way. Your garden will not slumber. See, the garden of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord will guard you from all harm from Esav and from Laban. He will guard your soul from the angel of death. The Lord will guard you, your going and coming. And Jacob went out from Be'er Sheva. Now, whoever looks at a Midrash like this, he says, King David wrote this psalm, most probably, because King David also collected a lot of other uh, psalms that were, that were around. There are Psalms in the, the Tehillim, in the book of Psalms, from Adam, from Moshe, and a lot of other Psalms from Korach, Bene Korach, sons of Korach. Uh, maybe this Psalm was written by Yaakov. Who, who knows? This Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachman, says that no, this, this is direct relationship. The, the way the Psalm is written, it is talking about Yaakov Avinu's uh, Christ with Esav and his you know, challenge over there that that 
does he trust God to keep him alive and keep his family alive? Because he was just about to be, Esav is returning or meeting him with 400 uh, men all on horseback, right? So maybe it could be a war. So his mindset is one where he is very troubled and that's when the psalm makes sense. Now to give such a such a connect with the psalm for the reader it becomes a total what we would call uh, uh, in cricket language you know you get, you get bold <laughs> this is a googly <laughs> what is the connection why is he connecting it with something like this harim and horim just one word that that he gets a point to say that I look I lift my eyes to the mountains and from there he says the mountains is really a hint to Horim and I look at what guides me about my parents and then he thinks about how when in his father's life Rivka was uh, sort of uh, brought back by Eliezer the servant of Abraham how Eliezer went there as a rich man gave her all this jewelry because of which it was easier to bring her back. And now I am a pauper. I am without any, I am without any uh, a single earring or a bracelet, right? So what I would like you to uh, really do is even between Midrashim, there are connects. And we would, I would like to share with you another Midrash, which is also on the same lines, which may be able to reveal to us what is what is uh, the connectivity. You know, I mean, you see the connect. Yes, I have to trust God even in my worst case scenario, right? That for sure is the final take of the Midrash. But still, what? How does the rabbi look at it? Why is this particular psalm? Because a lot of psalms are talking about it. Why the hell? Why? Because this psalm is about hell and where it comes from. So it is very apt. But still, we would like to go a little deeper. Let us look at the proof text, the text that from our parasha where the psalm is hinting at, right? Or where the psalm is coming from. Jacob resumed. That should be a resumed. Okay. Genesis 29. Jacob resumed his journey and came to the land of Easterners. I don't know. Some mistakes have crept in. Now this is resumed after after he had the uh, vision or the dream of the ladder and he promises to give a tenth if you all will remember. And then he opens his eyes and he sees that he has a dream of Hashem and angels on the ladder. He says, if Hashem will be with me and will be my God, then I will give back a tenth and will bring me back alive. Right? So after that, Jacob resumed his journey and came to the land of the Easterners. There, before his eyes, was a well in the open. Three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, or the flocks were watered from the well. The stone on the mount of the well was large. These flocks were lying beside it because the flocks came to drink water over there. Were watered means were normally watered from that well, but they have they are still waiting for the water. The stone on the mount of the lock, lock, well was large, but the, there was a stone. It was locked or sealed. When all the flocks were gathered there, the stone would be rolled from the mount mouth of the well and the sheep watered, then the stone would be put back in its place on the mouth of the well. So that was what they practiced when everybody was there from the village, Every, all, all the shepherds obviously. Then and only then would they roll back the stone and water everybody. So nobody can, can uh, you know, I don't know, claim that somebody stole from, from the well or whatever. Jacob said to them, my friends, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. So they are still not in Haran. They are in the field. They are outside Haran. 
And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? He said, yes, we do. He continued, is he well? They answered, yes, he is. And there is his daughter coming with the flock. So, perfect timing. He is talking about Laban and Laban's daughter, Rachel, is just about to enter the scene. He said, it is still broad daylight. Too early to round up the animals. Water the flock and take them to pasture. So it's still early. They can still feed a little bit more. Why are you still waiting over here? Take them to the fields. Give them water and take them to the fields. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are rounded up. Then the stone is rolled off the mouth of the well and we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's flock for she was a shepherd, shepherdess. And when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his uncle Laban, and the flock of his uncle Laban, Jacob went up and rolled the stone of the mount, mouth of the well and watered the flock of his uncle Laban. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and broke into tears. This is the proof text on which the, that Midrash and other Midrashim that we are going to talk about are, are going to are going to this is where he thinks about I came here as a pauper without any earrings or ear, any any jewelry for my bride to be and one of the reason is that that he cries so Vaishak he kisses Rachel and he raises, raises his voice and cries. That is what is the wording of the Torah. So this is the Bidrash coming from Rabbi Eliezer. Why did he weep? He said at the time that Eliezer brought Rivka, what is written about it? The servant took ten camels, etc. But I didn't take a single nose ring or a single bracelet. You see, this Midrash is repeating the same idea which is there in the other Midrash with Shirla Malot. So one idea is, but I did not take a single nose ring nor a single bracelet. And that's why he weeps. Because he feels very, uh, what do you say, sad about the fact that he comes empty-handed. Another explanation, why did he weep? As he saw that he would not be buried with him. She would not be buried with him. Now that is, you know, totally off. <laughs> where does, I mean, where does this idea even creep in that she will not be buried with him? You know? And, I mean, it's so far-fetched that they are just meeting for the first time, right? And his, he, he has this whole vision, or at least he is, he is a, a premonition sort of that she would not be buried with him, which means that he also recognizes that she will be his wife. He also recognizes that he marries her. He also recognizes that she would not be buried with him, finally. Where is this coming from? And that is what, when, when we are reading Midrash, we are like totally stumped. How, how does the rabbi connect these ideas? Why would Yaakov Abinu, you know, just first meet, meeting with uh, Rachel would even have a premonition about her death, right? Very weird. Now, to look at it, as two different ideas, we we think that they are different ideas, yeah, but they are coming from the same source. He is he is crying, and that the cause for crying could be either he is not going to be buried, or that he is poor and he will not be able to uh, give her the gifts. Two very different ideas. Which one is true? If one is true, the other one is probably not true. And if it is not true, then why is it Torah? Torah is a myth. How do we, how do we need to reconcile this? 
so i mean is it just explanations that come out of our head like let's let's talk about <laughs> what could cause it here yeah, it could be this it could be brainstorming right is it brainstorming that the rabbis are doing and then it is passed on for generations you know rabbi eliezer what what weird ideas he had when he was brainstorming so the fact is there is there there is another midrash i was searching for this midrash but i i could not find uh, find it in the books i have here and i didn't have time today to research it on the web but there is another fantastical midrash and that midrash is connected with this midrash the midrash is yakov avinu obviously when he left he left with permission from his father he left no doubt he left to save his skin from esau but esau was not pursuing him right esau said that i will kill you only after my dad passes away right when i when i will be mourning for my dad that's when i am going to kill you the same day i more mourn for him i'll kill you so so there was no rush sort of for um, yakov to run away without any without any uh, camels or whatever then last year if you will remember i had said that there is a episode where after after the um, dream of the ladder yakov he sets up the stone and anoints the stone with oil where does he get the oil from in, in the desert you know outside <laughs> he was not in in a inhabited place right so he had camels and he had oil and he had food with him and everything he had probably right i mean it makes sense he will have because his mother took permission from her father, from her husband that let let us send this son so that he will marry my brother's daughters correct so so when he left he, ha- he is supposed to have left with all what what he is talk- thinking about so what happened when he reaches haran why is it that he is a pauper so the midrash fills in Midrash says, Esau, when he heard that Yaakov Avinu had fled, he sent his son Eliphaz behind him to kill him. Father instructed, the son has to do his duty. So he comes to kill him and overtakes him and he says, "My dad asked me to kill you, Yaakov Avinu." but he is very difficult for him because he has played on yakov's lap that's what the midrash says it's very difficult for eliphaz to kill yakov so he is in you know dilemma what what can i what can i do so yakov have no tells him you know what you go back and take all all the 10 camels that are with me and all the jewelry that is with me and everything with with me and make me a pauper a pauper A poor person is like a dead person. A poor person is like a dead person. So you can then lie to your father that you killed me, because technically you killed me. Right? This is what the midrash is saying, and that is what Eliphaz does. Eliphaz goes back, taking all his all his money, and. and leaves him alone and now he is by himself without any uh, what do you say without any possessions or whatever and he reaches empty handed and that's why he is saying that i i cannot gift anything now once we add this midrash into the bring it on the table right we have added to the soup now we see that these two midrashim will again be connected why because in this midrash poverty and death are are connected and in the earlier midrash poverty is equated with death hmm? so poverty is equated with death 
not only that, you know, there, there are some so many very difficult things like Yaakov Avinu. What, what was Yaakov's problem in life that he was called Yaakov? Yaakov is because he came holding on to the heel of Esau. But he is crooked. That is the part of our body which is crooked, right? That is why when he cheats or tells, takes the baracha from Ishaq, let us, uh, for a minute, let me see if I can get this off the screen. No, I am so bad at this. I really don't know why. Maybe this is where it is. I'm going to stop sharing now, but I want to bring it back a little later. Is it stop sharing? Oh, good. Learning. So, so we were we were discussing this idea that poverty and death are related, right? This is an idea that comes through the midrash, and in this. By not directly, but indirectly, he is weeping because he has a premonition about her death, that she will not be buried with him, and that he will be, he will be, and that he comes as a pauper. Now, I would like you all to think about these two ideas. We all know the story of Yaakov, right? Yaakov goes to Haran. Aran tells her, tells his uncle that he wants to marry Rahel. He fell in love with her. He says, okay, what is the bridal price? Seven years. Seven years of working for me, and you can have uh, Rahel. After seven years, he gets cheated, and Leah is given to him. In the morning he sees that it's not Rahel, it's Leah after the wedding night. The nuptial night. He goes back to his uncle. He says, "We don't do what you do at your end. You know, the older, <laughs> younger is not cannot go before the older." Right? He says, "But I will give you Rachel also. Work for another seven years." So, next week he marries Rachel. Works for another another seven years. Now, why does he get cheated? The reason he gets cheated is because he could not pay the bridal price and pick up the daughter he wanted and go back home. Right? So because he gave all his money to Eliphaz, according to the Midrash, what causes that, the effect of that is that he has to be in a situation where he is uh, uh, Sort of insecure. He is. He is. Uh, he can be. He can be used, and he was used by Laban, not once but twice. He does get married to these two sisters, but the price is price is very high. So that he convinces Eliphaz to take his money works against him, right? So he has to, he has to work all his life. Finally, another seven years he works, and after twenty-one years, the angel comes and says, "Okay, move out. Enough of staying with Lavan." And then he, and he decides to sort of run away. So his position is so bad that he cannot, he cannot even, you know, openly say bye to his father-in-law. All because of which, so because of the fact that he was a pauper, right? Now think about it. Even in his life, the fact that because he was he was poor, and he had to he worked for his bride, but his father-in-law cheated him. The minute he cheated him, what happened? What caused the strife between the sisters? The older had children, the younger did not. Rachel did not have children. All of the time, there was strife in his family. 
she was childless it is as if he he had a family but full of strife there was never shalom in his house so again where there is such a situation he really didn't have you know he had her as a wife but he really didn't have the relations that that he should have had with her you see once she comes and says why don't you pray for me on my behalf and um, yakov said am i in god's stead although he has his predecessors you have abraham abi pleading to god you know let us have children let me have children and that's why he makes some makes some mistake and sara thinks that he only prayed for himself <laughs> not for her but he asks for children am i going to die and is eliezer going to inherit everything so what he says right we study so abraham intervenes it's kak he pleaded in instead of his wife for his wife's sake to have children so the man he married at 40 and at 60 she got pregnant for 20 years they were waiting for children but he prayed he did not marry the second woman no such things he said i want a wife, oh, children and i want it from my wife um rifka yakov we know when he knows that this is how his parents have acted thank you when he knows his parents have acted like this he said am i in god's stead and again there is another midrash which says that yakov don't you know when somebody is in pain how how you are going to uh, how you need to respond her kids her you all your children because uh, yakov at that point already had children from leah so all your uh, your children are going to bow down to her child and that's why yosef sort of becomes the wazir in egypt so that all his children bow down to her <laughs> i mean so that is also his child but because yakov avino was not sensitive enough midrash makes another connect over there okay everybody with me till here so the midrash although is very you know simple the two things we think oh the two things are you because he was poor and because he was no but the midrash is talking about some very deep things that have happened because obviously the rabbi has read the whole torah when he is bringing up the midrash right so he is saying after studying this we understand that this is what it is yakov having yakov not only in that in her death rachel was uh, estranged from him but even in his life she was estranged from him even in his life he really could not could not uh, be close to her because of the challenges that they had the, chal- the challenges happened because of what because of the fact that he gave away all his money to elifas let's see what more can i bring to the table on did you bring it up no sorry about that trying to learn this open share tray let's talk right where will this go mm-hmm. 
Windows. Ah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I did it successfully this time. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> okay. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, as expected. See. Why? What happens if I do this and then this? It doesn't take. I am sorry, but this is. Okay, thank you. Baruch atah Adonai, Elohenu menech olam, Shekhoi mihoi paro. No, no, no. Let's try one once more. Any luck? No. Anyway, so here is another idea where the rabbis come from. Okay. Rabbi Hanila said, anyone who says that God just lets things slide, let him forfeit his own insides. That means let him, let him die. Instead, he delays his anger, but will eventually collect what is rightfully his. For it was a single scream that Jacob caused Esau to let out. As it is written, when Esau heard his father's words, he let out a great and a bitter cry. And when did Jacob pay for that? Centuries later in Sushan, the capital city, as it says, and Mordechai let out a great and bitter cry. Now, another Midrash over here. Linking over centuries. The great and bitter cry that Esau cried after he heard that Yaakov had cheated him was paid back to Am Israel, the descendants of Yaakov, by Haman, who decided to eliminate every Jew on the planet. Okay. For all those who we know Haman's uh, lineage, who was Haman? Haman ben Am Hamedata ha Ag Agadi. Yeah. From the family of Agag. Who was Agag? Agag was the king that King Shaul, Saul, had a war with, and, and Shmuel Hanavi killed him. From the people of Amalek. Yes, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Please raise your hand at least. Okay. So, Amalek, we know Amalek later also that we have a, a mitzvah to eliminate Amalek in the Torah. That mitzvah was to be done once we establish a monarchy. The first monarch, the first king of the Jewish people was supposed to eliminate the people of Amalek. And that was somebody who, who, who that king, the king who was given the task was Saul. Saul did do the war, but he let Amalek alive. Again, the Midrash says that because he was a king, he had to give him a maid servant. So he has to give, although he was in a prison, but he had to give him a maid servant. So the maid servant gets pregnant that night, and the next morning Samuel comes and finishes Amalek and says, Why is he alive? And finishes him. 
Samuel himself kills Amalek. Man of God, prophet. But when he sees that Amalek was alive, he just draws his sword, Saul's sword, King Saul's sword, and kills Amalek. But nobody knows that that lady becomes pregnant who was with him the, the, that, that night. And from the descendants of that, that child, you have Haman. Okay? Is it clear? Now, coming back, who was Amalek? Amalek was the son of Eliphaz. Eliphaz, the son of Esav. Esav's grandfather, grandson was Amalek. So, again, this Midrash is connecting two different dots. Saying, you know what? <laughs> Esav screamed a scream because of the actions of Yaakov Avinu. He, that scream, the cost of that scream was Yaakov's life. Sort of. That's what the Midrash is saying. The life was supposed to be taken by I mean, now we know from what we have been discussing that life was supposed to be taken by Eliphaz. But Yaakov Avinu convinced Eliphaz to take his money instead and became a pauper and paid the price by not having a proper relationship with his wives, by not having a proper family, a peaceful family, by by having all the, all the incidences in his life, even the, even the sale of Yosef later is because of this strife between the brothers. All, all the cause of that is because he could not have a bridal price and pick up his wife with money. Right? So that Eliphaz let him go. But his son Amalek was somehow spiritually motivated to finish the task his father did do. And it continues generation after generation after generation till it reached a pinnacle where in Purim's story, right? Haman decides to do it when he is in a position to do it. So you see, when we are talking about Midrashim, they are not so they are not so um, superficial that he only cried because he thought that. Uh, his wife is not going to be buried. There is so much more deep connect with all these ideas that we need to un unpack them, unravel them and understand. Okay, this is something with that I had not planned for this class. So let us bring uh, bring that proof text for a second. Oh, nothing moves in your screen. One second, sorry. Twenty-seven thirty thirty-five. Okay, good. So this is the proof text. How how are we doing on time? Started at okay half an hour more. Till now, any questions? Everybody with me? Good. Yes. Yes, yes. Shall we continue? Yes, sir, I can go ahead. So let us read this proof text. We go back into Genesis 27. No sooner had Jacob left the presence of his father Isaac after taking the Baracha, after Ishak had finished blessing Jacob, then his brother Esau comes back from his hunt. He too prepared a dish and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father sit up and eat of his son's game so that you may give me your innermost blessing. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son Esau, your firstborn. Ishaq was seized with a violent trembling. Who was it then? He demanded. That hunted game and brought it to me. Moreover, I ate of it before you came and I blessed him. 
Now he must remain blessed. Esau heard his father's voice. He burst into a wild and a bitter sobbing. How does it say in Hebrew? Waits act. And he said to his father, Bless me too, father. It says in Hebrew, Kishmoa Esav et divrei aviv. Waits act se aka gedola. Umara. And he screamed a loud, loud scream. He burst. But that is not translated correctly in the English here. Waits ak sa aka gedola. And he screamed a loud scream. Umara. Ad meod. So he burst into a, a scream. A scream means, I mean, it is, it is a painful scream. So that's why the translation says bitter sobbing. But it is Saka Gedola Umara. Oyomer Ba Achicha Bebirma Weikach Birchatecha. He says, Your brother came with guile and took away your blessing. Next page. Okay, good. Ouch. Where did this come from? I have no idea. But we we came to the way it's Aksa Aka Gedola Umara. So in this in this particular I think the last line over there is again missed by me. Let me see one second. Twenty-seven thirty-eight. Okay, so thirty-eight. So there are three lines which I missed. Give me a second, I just need to pull a book. When you cut paste from from the internet, sometimes <laughs> These things happen. So, verse Genesis 27, 35. Okay. 27-35 is... Bless me to father. But he answered, Your brother came with guide and took away your blessing. Esau said, Was he then named Jacob that he might supplant me these two times? First he took away my birthright and now he now takes away my blessing. And he answered, he added, Have you not reserved a blessing? Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered, saying to Esau, But I have made him master over you. I have given him all his brothers for servants and sustained him with grain and wine. And then can I still do what? What then can I still do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, father? Bless me too, father. And Esau wept aloud. And his father answered him, saying, See, your abode shall be, shall enjoy the fat of the earth and the dew of the heavens above. Yet by your, your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother 
But when you grow restive, you shall break his yoke from your neck. So over here, and Esa wept aloud. The translation of what are the words? Isa Esav Kolo Vayepach. Isa et Kolo, and he raised his voice and he cried. So there are two lines, two, two sentences over here that the Midrash really is taking its hint from. The first Midrash, the first idea that we were speaking about earlier, Yaakov. When he sees Rachel, he kisses her and he, excuse me, when he raises his voice and wept. The same phraseology is originally over here, that he raises his voice and wept. That particular uh, phrase, he raises his voice and wept, is something where you, you are totally hopeless. The, maybe I have uh, okay. I don't know. I thought I may have had it. Okay. Yeah, here it is. To make it short, early next morning, Abraham took some bread and skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He placed them over his shoulder. Everybody has this, or uh, this didn't move? No, it didn't move. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Did it? Not yet? We have come to ask for the son of the slave woman. Yes. Like. Okay. So, yeah. So the second, second line. Early next morning, Abraham took some bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He placed them over her shoulder together with the child and sent her away. And she wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone from the skin, she left the child under one of the bushes and went and, went and sat down at a distance, a bow shot away, for she thought, let me not look at the child lies. And sitting thus far, she burst. Crying. The word crying is missing. Okay. So again, Vatisa et Kola Vayep. And she raised her voice and she cried. Here again, you see that when Hagar was hopeless, she didn't know how to save her child, right? She gives up the child, puts it under one of the bushes and goes and sits crying and screaming. That is when this kind of crying happens. She raises her voice and she cries. So we have Hagar crying like that. We have Esav crying like that. But we have Yaakov crying like that. What on earth is Yaakov going to lose when he cries like this? Because when he meets Rachel, that is the same phraseology that is used. That is the hint that the rabbis get. There is something wrong with his crying. Yes, he met her. Yes, he kissed her. Why does he cry and why does the Torah mention it to us in the language that he lost something and he's hopelessly lost it? Okay. So from other textual hints, we see that what is the jumping board, the point of departure for the Midrash. The Midrash takes the hint from here and says Yaakov lost something terribly. So Yaakov had a prophetic vision of him losing Rachel. Okay. Or 
him losing his standing sort of because of his poverty he he lost his his uh, bearing either way that is why yakov avinu cries but the hint is in the language okay. the second uh, connect connection that i would like you to pay attention to is I am so sorry that this is all one big mess today. <laughs> it was too rushed. Okay. Okay. In in this, there is another another such phrase that. Is again a point of departure for the rabbis, and here it is: When Esau heard his father's words, the second last line, he burst into wild and bitter sobbing. The, but the, the Hebrew is, "It's ak se aka gedola umara." Now there is only one other place the Torah uses very similar language, but a little different, and that is in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, let's see. Maybe it is a little earlier. I don't know why. It's not here, but I'll I'll just forget forget all this uh, for a minute. I'm going to go this kind of this. We'll do it orally. We don't need this. In the book of Esther, when Haman issues the verdict, the edict for all the Jews to be finished, all the Jews to be killed, right? That's when Mordechai gives out a tzaka like this, and when it's Ak Mordechai, tzaka gedola umara. And Mordechai screamed a very bitter scream and cried. The Chachamim over here, when they say in the last last midrash that we were talking about that the repayment of Yaakov Avinu's scream that he caused Esav to uh, to cry was, you know, at the point where. At the point where uh, Haman decided to annihilate the Jewish people, why? Because that old Saka Gedola Umara was then coming back to Am Israel. That's where the representative of Jewish people, Mordechai, screamed that scream. Okay. So again, the connecting points that the Midrash use. Mostly is what is called as Gezera Shama. There is a there is a phraseology that repeats itself. So you will let let us till till you try to understand what I have been building. Right? You have Yaakov Avinu. He goes at the well, meets his bride to be, falls in love with her madly, gives her a kiss, and cries a cry which is a hopeless, sad cry. It should be, would be tears of joy meeting his cousin. It should be tears of joy meeting his soulmate or whatever. But no, this cry is a very sad cry. So what is this sad cry? He had a prophetic vision. The prophetic vision was about the fact that he will never be able to be with her, be with her in his life, because he didn't have the money to buy her. 
part with the bridal price, be with her in her, her death because whatever is going to cause her to be estranged from him. The same idea, what is in Yaakov's Avinu, the effect, what was the effect of? That he, had, he is running away from his father, he, from uh, his brother, sorry. He's running away from his brother. He paid whatever money he had in his hand to Eliphaz to save his life. But that particular decision was a very difficult one because everything that comes after that is very costly for him. So all whatever happens, the ball sets rolling. He becomes a pauper. He works for seven years. He gets cheated. Because he gets cheated, his wives are at loggerheads. Uh, with each other, jealous about each other. Their children continue that jealousy. Then as Yosef gets, uh, I mean, from Yaakov Avinu's perspective, gets killed, but he is sold into slavery till the very end where they reconcile. Yaakov Avinu, that's why they descended into Egypt. And because they descended into Egypt, we had the whole episode of 210 years of slavery. So what caused it? Yaakov Zabinu's blunder. Similarly, the other Midrash is building the whole idea of the repayment of that scream comes when he wants to take vengeance, when Haman wants to annihilate the people. So Esav decides that he wants to do it, but it remains in their psyche the whole nation's psyche, and not the whole nation's maybe, but at least in Amalek's psyche, till Amalek is annihilated totally. Now, I hope I have one another idea, which is sort of a positive idea. On some grounds, when Esther is approached by uh, Mordechai, and she is she is asked, go to the king. She hesitates. She says, the king has not given me a call. Uh, I cannot go there without his permission, you know. So he says, don't you think that because you are in that position, that you are the queen, that this is not going to come to you. He says, if you don't act now, then you and your father's house are all going to be eliminated. But Revah Behatsala, and the word Revah Hatsala is, Hatsala is, um, help or deliverance. Revah, help and deliverance will come from some other place. But you will all, you, you and your father's house will be finished. So Mordechai knew something that he was confident that they will not never get finished. And he understands that Esther needs to act. But where does he know that Revach Vihat Sala comes from a, uh, comes, will come to Amisrael, right? So the Hamim, when they are connecting the dots, again, see these two words, they are nowhere in the Torah except for one place where you will see these two words in the same episode, not together with each other. But there is one episode over here which says when Yaakov Avinu is coming back, he goes out of his way to send messages to Esav in Seir. Esav is not staying with Ishak that he needs to meet him. No, he could have directly gone to his father, but no, he wanted to clarify something, clear something. Uh, make peace with his brother. So he sends messengers. And that is the episode that I'm going to read from. I'm not going to, maybe I quickly try again if this comes up. Okay. Not bad. Works. Then Jacob said, O God of my father,
Abraham and God of my father Iskak, O Lord, who said to me, return to your native land and I will deal bountifully with you. I am unworthy of all the, the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. This is where, this is the Midrash that the other point of the Midrash was connecting. The first Midrash we saw with Shir Lamalo is talking about this episode, right? So, I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have so, uh, so steadfastly shown your servant. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan and now I have become into two camps. Deliver me, I pray. And the word is Hatsilenina Niadachi. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, as I fear he may come and strike me down. Mothers and sons are right. Yet, you have said, I will deal bountifully with you and make your offsprings as the sand of the sea, which are too numerous to count. After spending the night there, he selected from what was at hand his presents for his brother Esau. She goats and 20 he goats. It was 200 she goats and 20 he goats, 200 eaves and 20 rams, milk camels and their, uh, 30 milk camels and their calls, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 she asses and 10 he asses. Then he put it, put in charge of his servant, drove by drove, and he told the servants, go on ahead and keep a distance between the droves. And the Hebrew is, Vaiten beyad avadav eder eder levado. In this story, the two words, Hatsileni and Revach, Revach ve Hatsalah, right, that Mordechai talks about are in a different form. Hatsileni is deliver me and Revach is when he acts to appease his brother, he is sending these gifts and he is putting Revach over here is distance. But Revach also means help, right? Between the between the rows. We have discussed the whole idea of these, these uh, gifts was to return back the blessing that Yaakov Avinu had cheated Esau of. We have discussed in the last class. Please refer to that class. Or I believe maybe Toldot, we, last year's Toldot, we had discussed this. Right? So, so Mordechai, when he is mentioning these two things to Esther, he is hinting to the fact, you know, Yaakov Avinu made a mistake, he made a blunder, but Yaakov Avinu, he repaired the problem. Yaakov Avinu returned the blessing to Esau. So if Esau's descendants have a problem in their head, they are not going to get through it. Because he was the one who did the Hatsilenina and he was the one who did the Revach. When he returned the gifts to ya Yaakov, to Esau, that's why I know for sure that punishment won't be due to him. He did what was necessary to repair the problem. Correct? That's where the first Midrash talks about from your parents or from whatever you learn. It is Mordecai now who is learning from Yaakov Avinu's action and understanding that, yes, no doubt that Hashem will, uh, what is the word, you know, uh, he, he, will, he, he will take his due of the scream that and the crying that Esau had to go. Uh, undergo, as I had to go through the pain of, but he cannot finish Yaakov because Yaakov finally gave him back the blessing. So, so that's why Mordechai can say that Revach Mehat Salah, these are the two words, are the, the hint words in this parasha. When a midrash is being made and connected, that is what the, the sofer, the darshan is doing. He is recognizing these key points to understand what are the the, uh, the message between the words, message between the lines, uh, the information that is being sent to us through these stories to tell us how history, all these stories of all the patriarchs, we say that the, the acts of our forefathers 
are a sign for our for the descendants what what does it mean that this is how whatever their acts were there are consequences but because they were giants there are also positive consequences there are positive merits that we we reap from from what they have done in their lifetimes so that's why the ups and downs in the history of the jewish people and if we will live by the messages of those positive consequences that that they were able to rectify the world rectify themselves then we will be able to also do what it needs to be to rectify the world and move in the direction that hakolish baruch wants so th- these are the ideas that the midrashim want you to recognize so the midrash is really using very simple language but very deep ideas how they are connecting these dots with with uh, the gezara shava the, the words that that uh, are key words in different parashiyot to build the midrash okay so hope uh, this was a little not very well <laughs> arranged class sorry about because i came in a little late and i was too to hurry to make this happen sorry about that but i hope the point is uh, point is understood if any questions please go ahead Yes, Ashley. No, I said I was just saying. Does anyone have any questions for a bite? Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. You are welcome. Have a fantastic week. Shabu Atov and Bora. Shabu Atov and Bora. We also have a fantastic week. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for joining. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.